are the three formulas of, for density. So this formulas is always applied on board ship when you are uh, uh, using the density, volume, and mass. So to work out density, P is equal to M over, uh, density is equal to mass over volume work out with the mass so you have to uh, what we call this uh, I forgot already the mass is equal to density times volume to work out with the uh, volume volume is equal to mass over density So here the presentation, density formula, how to calculate density, density is equal to mass over volume, and here mass, density and volume, density equals mass divided by volume, mass equals density times volume, volume equals mass density. So remember this formula because during the examination this one will be helpful. What is density? Density is a mass per volume not just the straight up mass. So if the question was which was more a 500 ml jug full of feeders or 500 ml jug full of lead then the the answer would be lead for an equal amount for space it takes up volume lead waste mass more than the feeders mass density can also be taught as a of as how compact or compressed a substance is. A pound of a feathers is filled with air space. So it's not very dense at all. While a pound of blade feels much more solid, so it's more dense. This is why you should never comment on uh, spans by describing is at as dense. This is always what uh, makes things float or sink. When you mix two or more substances in the most dense substances to the bottom, whilst the less dense substance is more buoyant and floats to the top, trying mixing oil and water and See how separate into layers with the least dense oil on top and water at the bottom. So here the presentation density example. These two objects are equal in volume but different in mass due to their density. So here this one is a low density. And here is higher density. So the high density will be at the bottom and the low density will be on top. So, we show this one already. What are the three formulas for density? The formula we show you above density is equal to mass over volume is the one we use to calculate density but as there are three elements so that the formula can be expressed in three different ways basically you can rearrange the structure to work out different elements to work with the density 
density equals mass over volume to work with the mass mass equals density times volume to work with the volume volume equals mass over density so here water has a density of 1000 or 1.0 therefore anything that floats in the water has less density than than that and anything that sinks has a greater density for example cooking oil is around 900 20 kilogram or 0.920 10 is 7310 kilogram per cubic meter cork is 200 so these are our examples 40 kilogram per cubic meter and aerosol one of of the less than solids we know of as a density of one kilogram so how come people float so easily in Dead Sea because it's not just water, it has an incredibly high amount of salt in it, creating an overall density of 1240 kilogram per cubic meter. Now describe the properties used to specify the state or condition of the substance. Properties are used to define the current state of a substance. These properties depend on how much matter of the system you measure. Examples of intensive properties are pressure, temperature, density, volume per mass, molar volume, which is volume per mole, and average molecular weight or molecular mass. Let us take a look at the video explaining what is a substance definition types and examples did you know that everything in the entire universe is some form of matter it's true anything that has mass and takes space is recognized as matter that means matter is everything including your desk your clothes your food and even you all matter however is not the same in fact, if we follow the flow chart shown here, we see that the matter around us can be classified in one of two categories, mixtures or substances. The term substance is fairly common and tends to be used with several different meanings in everyday language. However, in the world of physical science, a substance is simply a pure form of matter. In other words, a substance is matter that contains only one type of atom or molecule. Meanwhile, a mixture contains a combination of different atoms or molecules and is therefore said to be impure. Continuing along our flow chart, we see that pure substances can be further divided into two subcategories, elements and compounds. Elements are the simplest form of matter, which means they cannot be broken down into smaller components physically or chemically. All elements are listed on the periodic table, and there are at least 118 of them known to man. Examples of elements include carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and sodium, just to name a few. Compounds, on the other hand, are made up of two or more different elements held together by chemical bonds and functioning as a unit. While compounds are also pure substances, they differ from elements because compounds can be broken down into simpler components, the elements that make up the compound. Some examples of compounds are carbon dioxide, rust, and table salt. Let's discuss a few examples of pure substances. A sample of silicon consists of only one type of atom, silicon atoms. Therefore, silicon is a pure substance. Since these silicon atoms are in their simplest form and cannot be broken down any further, the substance silicon is also an element. Remember, an easy way to figure out whether or not something is an element is to look Let us play another video explaining uh, what is a substance. Give the distinction between absolute and specific quantities and intensive and extensive values. A property can be classified as extensive or, or 
intensive an intensive property depends on the size of the system while an intensive property is dependent on the size of the system so let us take a look this video intensive and extensive samples if you've studied chemistry for some time, you've probably noticed that it has a lot of properties that are used to define matter. Throughout introductory chemistry, you solve problems looking at mass, number of moles, melting point, densities, and several other variables that will affect the system you're studying. You may have noticed that some of these properties are more intrinsic or unique to the specific substance being examined. These unique properties are also known as intensive properties. Intensive properties are properties of matter that do not change when you vary the amount of matter. Other properties, such as mass, will vary depending on the amount of matter. These properties are called extensive properties. You can remember the difference by thinking about the fact that extensive properties are directly affected by the extent of the substance or how much matter you have. In properties are more intrinsic or essential to the nature of the substance. We're going to look into a few examples to better understand these distinctions. Let's first start with extensive properties, or those that rely on the amount of matter. If you have 200 grams of water in a glass and pour out half of the glass, you now only have 100 grams. This is because you have got rid of half of the amount of matter in the system. In much the same way, if you have a liter of water and pour out half, you now only have half of a liter. Extensive properties are those properties that deal with the amount or answer any of the how much questions. Can you think of any other examples that are extensive properties? An obvious one may be the number of moles. Many chemistry problems will ask you to solve the number of moles in a specific amount of matter. Since this is a how much type of property, you can easily identify it as an extensive property. There are only so many ways that we can define the amount or extent of matter. What about all of these other properties that we use to describe matter? The remainder of these are intensive properties, or those that do not change when you change the amount of matter. Remember when we poured out half of a glass of water, decreasing the mass from 200 grams to 100 grams? If the water started at 20 degrees Celsius, the water would have stayed 20 degrees Celsius, even when we removed half of the matter. This behavior helps us identify temperature as an intensive property. You may have learned earlier that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Whether we are talking about a lake or just a glass of water, both will freeze once the water reaches zero degrees Celsius. You may be thinking, but wait, it will take a lot longer to freeze a lake rather than a glass of water. However, the freezing point is not concerned with the amount of time it takes to reach a certain temperature, but rather just describes the behavior that water will transition from liquid to solid at zero degrees, regardless of the amount of matter. Thus, freezing point is an intensive property in Describe the different forms of energy involved in thermodynamics. Ito lang kakaw. Anong samok-samok eh. Ipuan ako ni. In thermodynamics, the macroscopic forms of energy are potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential and kinetic energy are based on external position and velocity references respectively. Microscopic forms of energy are those that relate to the system on molecular or atomic level. Let us talk, uh, let us take a look this video explaining the energy, uh, the different energy involved in thermodynamics.
Let's talk about one of the most fundamental ideas in science, and that is the notion of energy. And energy definitely has some meaning in our everyday life. If we, we kind of imagine things that are moving or hot or, or bright as being energetic. But what I want to talk about in this video is a more formal definition of it, a more scientific definition. And the most typical one that's often given is the ability to do work. Ability to do and I'm going to put work in quotes because the notion of work here isn't the everyday notion of work where you go to your job and you work nine to five and you get paid. Work in a physics context is a little bit, it's not completely unrelated to our everyday notion of work, but I'll give you an example just to get a, a better idea of it. So let's say that you have some object here and you were to apply a force, you were to apply a force in that direction and the magnitude of that force let's say it's 10 newtons and if the if the units newtons and force isn't too familiar to you uh, don't worry too much uh, but you can also review it on those videos on Khan Academy but you apply a force to the right on this object and by doing that you're able to move the object you're able to displace the object in the same direction as that force so you're able to displace it let's say 10 10 meters so after you've done it the object the object is right over here. So when you do this, you apply a force and you're displacing, and, and that's causing the object to do, be displaced in the direction of that force, you would say that work has been performed. And the amount of work that has been performed would be 10 newtons times 10 meters. And so 10 times 10, it would be equal to 100, and then the units are newton meters of work. 100 newton meters, because you're multiplying newtons times meters, of newton meters of work and newton meters that has been defined as the joule which is the unit of work and also the unit of energy so this is the same thing as 100 i could write it out joules 100 joules or we can just abbreviate it with a j so 100 joules of work has been performed here by moving this so we've done we've taken so we, we've done something here and this is considered to be work 100 joules of work if we move this twice as far then it would be 200 joules of work and so energy is the ability to do this type of work now let's look at let's look at these pictures here which are depicting different forms of energy and let's see if we can identify the forms of energy and then think about how they can relate to actually doing work so if we look at the fire here, there's some uh, maybe obvious forms of energy. We have some thermal energy. It's Fires are definitely hot, so thermal energy. But we should think about what is thermal energy fundamentally. A, a, a system's temperature is really about the average kinetic energy of its molecules. So thermal energy is really about the energy of movement. It's really about all these little molecules here because of the combustion reaction going on, they're getting excited, and they have higher kinetic energy, and so the temperature goes up. Their average kinetic energy goes up. So thermal energy is really a form of energy due to movement. And the general term for energy due to movement is kinetic energy. So thermal energy is really a form of kinetic, kinetic, kinetic energy. You also have light being emitted. That has energy as well. We call that radiant energy. So that light being emitted, that's the reason why we can see this fire. Radiant, radiant energy. Now you might say, okay, maybe that's all of the energy in the system, but I'll say, no, there's another form of energy. And actually, even in this picture, that's probably where most of the energy is. And that's potential energy. So where is the potential energy? Well, it's, it's sitting in the bonds of the fuel over here. So these are either chips of wood or charcoal of some kind, but these are formed by carbon-carbon bonds. So you have these carbon-carbon bonds, and they could be bonded to other carbons or other, other things. And they're also going to be bound to some hydrogens here and there. So you're going to have... You're going to have bonds like this that actually store energy in them. They have the potential to be released. If you're able to break these bonds, those electrons are going to get into a lower energy state, or they might bond with other things. And in the process, they're going to release energy that's going to be radiant energy and thermal slash kinetic energy. So what, how does this happen? How do these bonds? How do these bonds actually get broken? Well, that's our good old friend, the combustion reaction. That's our good old friend, the combustion reaction where you take, some, you take some oxygen, you take some heat, or we could say some energy. So it takes a little energy to get started. That's why you might have to light this with a, 
with a match to begin with. So oxygen plus energy, plus energy. And then you could say, plus these carbon-carbon bonds, and we could say, plus you know whatever it is, these fuels which are made out of carbon, either charcoal or wood. So plus, I'll write, I'll do it like this. I'll draw some carbon-carbon bond right over here. That's going to combust. And I'll do this in a color. So that is, that is going to, I'm really having trouble changing colors. This is going to combust, combust, and it's going to release, it's going to release water because these the fuel has hydrogens in it. It's going to release carbon dioxide and it's going to release a lot more energy. I'll do that in caps. It's going to release a lot more energy. And that energy we see in, in the form of the kinetic energy of the molecules and the radiant energy being emitted. Now you might say, okay, I, I can buy that. I have this potential energy here. And this potential energy that's in the bonds of these, of these between these atoms, we call that chemical potential. So we have chemical, chemical potential energy. Potential, potential energy is right over there. But you might say, okay, I buy that. The chemical energy is being converted to into the thermal energy and the radiant energy. And this is actually an interesting point. Energy, this is a law of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form or another. But you might be saying, okay, I can convert from one form to another, but how can this actually do work in the way that I've even depicted here? Well, the entire industrial revolution is all about trying to uh, tr convert from one form of energy to another and also to do work. So a steam engine is fundamentally based upon on combustion, uh, heating up some steam, and then that steam can expand, and then it can push a piston to do all sorts of things, including move a train. Combustion is what's going on in your car engines, where the pistons are expanding due to the, due to the thermal energy, and then that helps drive the drivetrain of the actual car. So it can clearly do work. So here we have some other examples. This is lightning. And so when you see the lightning, there's something clearly very kinetic is going on. You have electrons, you have electrons moving from the cloud, from the cloud to the ground. And you might say, so this, this right over here, that is, you could say that's kinetic energy. Kinetic, kinetic energy. And you might say, well, how can I do work with that? Well, that's what the whole electronics industry is all about. Uh, that's what power lines are all about. Movement of electrons, that's current. And current can be used to do all sorts of amazing things. You can actually have an electric motor is one way to actually do it. So that's kinetic energy there. There's clearly radiant energy going on. We can see the lightning. And that radiant energy is due because the air gets ionized and gets heated. And so there's also thermal energy. As the electrons go down, there, there's heat that is actually being generated. Now, where did, where did this energy come from? It just doesn't come from uh, anywhere. Well, you have all of this potential energy that starts, that starts building up in these clouds as the water vapor rises. And the mechanism isn't, isn't fully understood of how this happens. But because of energy from the sun, you have water vapor rising. As the water vapor rises through the clouds, the, the, neg the bottom part of the cloud becomes more negative. It becomes more electron rich. And the top parts of the cloud become more positive. And so you have these electrons that really want to get down here. And then the ground, because the, the, the air above the ground becomes more negative, the ground starts becoming more positive. And so you can imagine these electrons more and more want to get down here, but this air isn't a natural conductor. But once the electric potential gets high enough, these electrons find a way. The air essentially get ionizes, and the electrons are able to find a path. So while this is all building up, you have this electrostatic potential building. So this is electrostatic, static, you can't see that that well, electrostatic potential. And how this forms, once again, so it's an area that people are still, there's some good theories out there about how this forms, but it's not 100% well established. And over here in this third old drawing of this person doing a handstand dive, this is probably uh, the, most, uh, uh, the most typical example of potential energy being converted into kinetic energy that you might find in a physics textbook. Over here at the top of the diving board, this gentleman has potential energy by virtue of his position. And over here, it's very clearly he has the potential to fall and it has the potential to turn it into kinetic energy. And so once he falls over, at this point, most of his potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. So here it's potential, here it's potential, and here it is kinetic, kinetic energy.
So the big takeaway is energy, it cannot, it's the ability to do work. It, it cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one form or another. And all of the forms, at the end, at their essence, you can really think about them as, in, in two big buckets. You can think about them as potential energy or kinetic energy or, or, or kinetic energy. And as the last example, you might say, well, how can this guy do work? Well, you can imagine if there was some type of system here, you system here where you know we'd cre create some machinery. Maybe there's a pulley right over here, and then and then it's lifting a weight right over here. Well, if he jumped on this, he won't fall down as fast. But then, if as long as he's heavier than this weight, it's going to pull this down, and then this weight is going to go up. So he has the potential to do work by virtue of his position. There just isn't this pulley system there to to get that actual work done. So let us continue. Give the statistic, statistical, statistical definition of entropy and enthalpy. In statistical mechanics, entropy is an extensive property of a thermodynamic system. It is closely related to the number ohms of microscopic configuration, con configurations known as micro microstates micro microstates microstates that are consent, consistent with the uh, macroscopic quantities that is characterize the system such as its volume pressure and temperature let us take a look another video ex explaining the uh, topic the statistical definition of entropy so let us take a look we've talked previously about the conceptual definition of entropy change as energy dispersal and in this video i want to shed more light on the actual nature of entropy by talking about the statistical definition of entropy itself before we dive in and start talking about the statistical definition of entropy we need to draw a distinction between the microstate of a thermodynamic system and its macrostate. The microstate consists of all of the positions and velocities, the microscopic positions and velocities of all of the particles within the system. So for example, for an ideal gas, if we were to sample or take a photo of an ideal gas system over time, we would see the particles with different positions and different velocities pretty much in every snapshot. One important thing to recognize about microstates, especially as you go on into more advanced coursework, is that microstates are quantized. According to quantum mechanics, there are discrete energy levels that particles are allowed to access. That leads to discrete velocities and even, in a sense, discrete positions accessible to the particles within a quantum system. That means that the number of possible microstates is finite, since the number of states accessible is finite. The macrostate corresponds to the bulk thermodynamic macroscopic state functions for the system. Examples of these are pressure, volume, temperature, internal energy, and entropy, for example. And there are other examples that we've talked about as well, such as enthalpy. In the introductory videos, we saw the idea that the macrostate functions, internal energy for example, are equal to averages over the microstate. Microscopic energies are averaged to calculate the observed macrostate internal energy, U for example. This idea is going to become important in a second. The statistical definition of entropy deals with the question of how random are the possible microstates for a system given a particular macrostate. So how random are, for example, three possible microstates that a system could access, little s1, little s2, and little s3, given a particular macrostate, capital or big S. Well, 
Let's think first about a hypothetical example where the microstate S1 has a probability of 1, while the probabilities of the second and third possible microstates are both 0. Well, in this case, we know exactly the microstate of the system. Essentially, you can think of it like the particles of the system are frozen in space. They're not moving, so they have zero velocity, and we know their positions exactly, and so no other possible microstates can exist. There's no randomness in a system like this, and so the entropy is zero. When there's zero randomness in the possible microstates, entropy is equal to zero. Let's look at a different probability distribution for the possible microstates. Let's imagine now that all of the probabilities were equal. So the three microstates had probabilities of 0.3 repeating each. Well, in this case, we can't really know which microstate the system is actually in since all three are equally probable. And in this case, the entropy is at a maximum and the randomness of the microstates is at a maximum. Since we can't really know without sampling, which microstate the system is actually in. But clearly, the probability distribution over the microstates, in other words, what probability does each microstate have for all the possibilities, figures deeply into the statistical definition of entropy. And for the remainder of this video, what, what we want to do is flesh out this relationship mathematically. Stated bluntly, how are entropy and the individual probabilities of specific microstates related? In general, there are a very, very large number of possible accessible microstates, for example, for an ideal gas system, and the number becomes explosive as you start adding particles and increasing volume. But one thing we can say, drawing an analogy from, for example, internal energy, is that the observed macroscopic entropy has got to be a weighted average over some function of these probabilities. It remains to be determined what that function actually is. But in writing this equation in the bottom right, what we're doing is using, for example, the weighted average of internal energy as an analogy. To find the average internal energy, we weight each microscopic energy by its probability of existing. The sum over all of those is equal to the average internal energy. Similarly with entropy, what we can do is multiply some function of the probabilities. We don't quite know what that is yet, but you can think of that as the microscopic entropy, the entropy per microstate. We multiply that by the probability of that microstate existing and sum over all the possible microstates to get the average entropy that we would observe macroscopically. So now we need to figure out the nature of this function f of the pi, the function of the probabilities of the specific microstates existing that relates back to entropy. One place to start is this idea that the macroscopic entropy must be a weighted sum of this function of the probabilities, each f of pi weighted by the corresponding probability p sub i. To flesh out this in more detail, let's think about bolting two independent systems A and B together. This is actually a common device in thermodynamics for learning more about thermodynamic state functions. So for example, let's say we took two ideal gases, you might be getting sick of seeing the ideal gas by now, I know I am, and bolting the two of them together. Now ideal gases don't interact, so the systems A and B are independent, and the particles within the system are still independent in the combined system A plus B. Let's imagine that we had m accessible microstates in system A, each with a set of probabilities, p sub i, so each of the m microstates has its own probability, p sub i. And in system B, we had n possible microstates, each of which has a probability, p sub j. How many total microstates are there for the combined system A plus B? Well, we can't simply add the microstates and say m plus n because the two sets are independent and so for a particular microstate of system A, let's call it I, there are n possible microstates of system B. And so what we're looking for here is not addition but multiplication. The total number of microstates in the combined system is the product of the two, not the sum. What's the probability of a kind of composite microstate in which system a is in state I and system B is in state J. Well, here again, we need to multiply the two probabilities. 
since the two systems are independent and the particles remain independent in the combined systems. The probability of a particular microstate in the combined system in terms of the original probabilities is pi times pj. Now what about the entropy of the combined system A plus B? Well, for one thing, we can use the equation in the top right. Now that we know the probability of a particular composite microstate, we can just sum over all those possible combined microstates. So we sum over the M for system A and the N for system B and do a weighted average of F of the probabilities. So the probabilities are now PI times PJ, and so F of PI times PJ times the probability PI PJ added up over all the possible microstates is equal to the entropy. This is just an incarnation of that equation in the top right, where we've replaced P sub I in that top right equation with PI PJ, the new probability of the composite microstate in the combined system. There's one other thing we should notice about the entropy of the combined system A plus B, and it's that if we think back to our conceptual or intuitive notions of entropy should be extensive. That means when we bolt two systems together, when we combine system A and system B, the resulting entropy of the combination should be the sum of the two entropies. What we can do then is write the entropy of system A as the sum over the m possible microstates for that system, pi, f of pi, and add to that the entropy of system B, the sum over the n microstates, p sub j, f of p sub j. So look at these two equations. They're related to each other. The entropy is equal to the sum over the two separate entropies and a sum over the composite microstates. When you combine these equations with one another and do some mathematical manipulations, you ultimately arrive at the idea that f of the product of two probabilities must be equal to the sum of f for those individual probabilities. So f of pi times pj must be equal to f of pi plus f of pj. Of course, the only function for which this works is the natural log. And so we now know then, using that equation in the top right, how entropy relates to the individual probabilities. We can say s is equal to the sum over all the possible microstates, the probability of that microstate times the natural log of the probability of that microstate. In practice, this is multiplied by a constant, Boltzmann's constant, and it's negated since the probabilities will be less than one and the natural logs will be negative. The negation ensures that entropy remains positive. So this is Boltzmann's statistical definition of entropy, just reproduced from the last sli slide, and it says that entropy is equal to negative Boltzmann's constant times the sum over all the possible capital N microstates now, the probability of that microstate times the natural log of the probability of that microstate. And this is a pretty neat concept, actually. You can relate Boltzmann's statistical definition back to thermodynamic quantities like heat and temperature and figure out some pretty interesting things about spontaneous processes. For the time being, I want to explore in more detail this second factor, this sum over all the possible microstates, pi natural log of pi. What is this exactly? What does it mean? And can we recast this equation in a somewhat more intuitive form? In particular, it's a little bit problematic to get, for example, the probability distribution over all the possible microstates. When there are millions upon billions upon billions of possible microstates, that probability distribution becomes simply unwieldy to deal with, especially if you're talking about a quantized or discrete distribution. You're talking about billions upon billions upon billions of numbers. Well, one thing we can do to simplify this distribution is to move the pi factor inside of the natural log. Moving p sub i inside the natural log puts it as an exponent on pi, so we've got the sum over all the possible microstates, the natural log of p sub i to the power of p sub i. Now, if we blow this sum up and write it as natural log of pi to the pi for each term in the sum, we get the natural log of p1 to the p1 power, natural log of p2 to the p2 power, plus the natural log of p3 to the p3 power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the sum of a set of natural logs is equal to the natural log of the product, right? And so we can pile all those terms into a single natural logarithm and say that this sum is equal to the natural logarithm of p1 to the p1 power times p2 to the p2 power times p3 to the p3 power. 
Now let's do something a little funky and plug this back in to the original definition of entropy, but invert the argument of the natural logarithm such that a negative sign pops out front. Doing this, the negative sign in the original equation is removed since we're multiplying a negative times a negative, and the argument of the natural logarithm is inverted. So we get the entropy is equal to Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of 1 over now, p1 to the p1 power, p2 to the p2 power, etc., 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 all the way to the last microstate, p sub n to the p sub n power. This argument of the natural logarithm is naturally, if you look at it, going to be a very, very large number. If we have a lot of accessible microstates, each of the probabilities is going to be quite low, and this number is going to be very, very large. This is a number called W, and it corresponds to the number of distinct microstates that lead to a particular or given macrostate. This is a more intuitive number to work with, and I hope to demonstrate this to you with a quick example. Really quickly, though, before we do that, that example, notice that we can now rewrite Boltzmann's definition of entropy in the top left as S is equal to positive Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of W. By thinking statistically and thinking in terms of combinatorics, we can often write down a number for W or at least relative W values for two situations, for example, an initial and a final state. So consider the following scenario. You've got a box with six compartments in it, and you start out with an ideal gas confined to one of those compartments with a volume V. All the compartments have equal volume, and so imagine, for example, you remove the inner walls so that the gas molecules were free to roam the entirety of the container, and you had a situation where when you expanded the gas to 6V, the 12 particles, count them, there are 12 particles in that ideal gas, spread themselves out so that there are two particles in each sixth of the box. What's W for each of these situations? Well, to figure out W, you can think about the probability of a particular particle existing within a particular box. In the case of the initial state with volume V, there's really only one way to prepare this microstate. We take all 12 particles of the ideal gas and throw them into the same box. The number of ways to do this is 12 things taken 12 at a time, or 12C12, which is equal to 1. Going back to our analogy from before, this situation completely lacks randomness. We can identify with certainty that all of the particles are in box 1. Therefore, it makes sense that the entropy should be equal to zero, and indeed, it comes out that the entropy is equal to zero when we take the natural log of W equal to one, right? What happens when we allow the gas to expand to a volume of 6V? Well, now what we can do is imagine preparing this microstate by throwing two particles down into each box. The number of ways to do this is much, much larger than one, because we start by taking, for example, two of the particles from the 12 and throwing them in the first box, and there are 12 C2, 12 things taken two at a time, ways to do that. We're then left with 10, and there are 10 C2 ways to throw two particles from the remaining 10 into the next box. We multiply that by the 12 C2, since these two events, throwing particles in box one and throwing particles in box two are independent, and we can continue going with this. So then we have eight particles left, so for box three, 8C2 for box 4, 6C2, box 5, 4C2, and finally for the last, last box, 2C2, and with only two particles left, there's only one way to throw the remaining two particles into that last box. But nonetheless, if you go off and calculate, for example, 12C2 and 10C2 and 8C2, you'll see that the product of all of these is going to blow up to be an enormous, enormous number. Just like we saw for the case of the spontaneously mixing gases, a gas expanding like this corresponds to a very large change in entropy. It is worth noting a couple of things, though. First of all, the natural log of W is related to S, so W can grow exponentially and S will grow only linearly. And the other thing is that Boltzmann's constant is quite small, so very, very large changes in W can correspond to relatively small changes in S in, for example, joules per Kelvin. Nonetheless, this equation, S is equal to KB natural log of W, really captures the statistical definition of entropy at its essence. The definition says that the more microstates that correspond to a particular macrostate, the more different ways there are to prepare a particular macrostate, the higher is the entropy of that macrostate. And in this example, what we're seeing is 
there are simply more microstates associated with two particles in each hypothetical box than there are with all 12 particles in a single box. That's why expanding the gas from V to 6V corresponds to a, an increase in S and a massive increase in W, the number of possible microstates. Let us take a look another uh, another video. Uh, this is also explaining the st statistical look at entropy. So we will watch this video. Take a statistical look at the idea of entropy. One of the best ways to do this is to imagine the dispersal of energy occurring from molecules actually dispersing into space. And that's fairly easy to envision for gas particles because we have a nice small particle model for gases. So let's start off imagining a situation where we have a box and the box is divided into two sides, a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And we'll imagine there's only one gas particle in the box. And so we'll say there's one little particle. And, and the key idea is that this particle is in motion. And it's important to remember that for all molecular pictures that we have of matter, the particles are always in motion. They're either vibrating or moving around. Even atoms and solids can be translating even if it's on very, very long time scales. So these molecules aren't fixed in space, but they can move. And so we want to ask a basic question, which is where will we find the gas in the box? Is it going to be on the left-hand side of the particle or the left-hand side of the box or the right-hand side of the box? So since the particle is moving around, it's just exploring all possible spaces. And what we want to look at are snapshots in time. So these aren't fixed positions, but this is what any configuration might look like if we just took a snapshot in time. So one chance is that the particle is on the right-hand side of the box, and we can imagine that if we let it move around and we took a bunch of snapshots, a good fraction of the time, in fact, exactly half of the time, we would discover the particle on the left-hand side of the box. And so with only one particle, these two are equally likely. That is, there's no reason to believe there'll be any difference between one particle on the left or one particle on the right. And so here we have a situation where we know if we wanted to know where is the particle, well, it's exploring the entire box. What happens though if we move on to two particles? If we have two particles, we now have two particles in the box and they're moving at the same time. And so we can imagine them starting on the left and then if they move around and then we take a snapshot, we might capture them both on the left. But if they're moving around and we're taking snapshots in time, we know that there's some chance that we'll find one on the right and one on the left. Or alternatively, they might switch places and the first particle might be on the left and the second particle might be on the right. Or we might in some snapshot in time find them both on the right. Now, these possibilities are not no longer equal to one another. And the reason they're no longer equal is that the particles don't have labels. We don't know which one is number one and which one is number two. And for that reason, these two here in the middle are actually the same configuration. That is, we would call them equivalent. And so if we looked at all possibilities and we said, what are the chances the particles are both on the left-hand side? Or what are the chances the particles are both on the right-hand side? Or what are the chances that there's one on each side? It is more likely that there's one on each side because there's two equivalent ways to achieve that. Particle one can be on the left and particle two on the right or two on the left and one on the right. As we increase the number of particles, we'll see that we get an ever-increasing number of equivalent states for different configurations. So let's look at what happens when we have four particles. 
If we have four particles, we now have to imagine there's some possibility that they could all show up on the left-hand side, but there's also a chance that one of them is on the right. And in fact, we know there's several ways to make this configuration. We could have the first particle there, or the second particle there, or the third particle there, or the fourth particle there. So have four different ways to achieve that configuration with three on the left and one on the right. Could be that there's two on each side. It could be that there's more particles over on the right-hand side. What we want to do now is to count up the different ways that we can arrange the particles and arrive at these equivalent configurations. So for that first one, we know there's only one way to do that. All of the particles have to be on the left. We call this number of ways of achieving this configuration, we give it a symbol omega. This is the number of equivalent microstates. So these pictures that we're taking are microscopic states of the system. Where is the energy? How is it distributed? Where are the particles? How are they distributed? So for the first one, there's only one way to do that. All of the particles have to be on the left. But as I pointed out, for the second one, there's four ways to do that because any one of the four particles could be the one on the right. And since they don't have numbers or letters on them, they're all exactly the same, then there have to be four equivalent ways to do that. Turns out that for the middle with the 50-50, there's six equivalent ways. And then for one on the left, there's four again. And all of them on the right, there's one again. So you can see now it's becoming ever more likely for us to be getting to this equally distributed. That is, that is the highest probability. So if the particles do whatever they want and we just take a snapshot at a moment in time, the most likely picture that we get is this one here in the middle because there are six different ways that we could arrive at that picture. However, it, it could be one of these other two. Those are equally likely, but these extremes are unlikely because they're very special microstates. And so we see that the chances of them is decreasing rapidly. If we move up now to 10 particles, now we can see that the 50-50 states here where we have five on the left and five on the right are becoming incredibly likely. That is 252 equivalent ways to make this state, whereas everybody on one side or the other is highly unlikely. And in fact, only one on one side or two on one side is very unlikely. So now what are the chances that we find things equally distributed? they're very, very high. What if we don't have one or two or four or 10 particles, but we have Avogadro's number of particles? If we have Avogadro's number of particles, it's extremely likely that we will get equally distributed particles because every particle on the left or every particle on the right has so small a chance of occurring that we can say it never happens. What will happen, let the particles go wherever they want, imagine a snapshot in time, they are going to be spread out 50-50 on each side of the box. What is forcing them to do this? Nothing. The particles simply move where they would like to move and the equally distributed case is simply statistically the most probable case. Does it have to be exactly 50-50? Half Avogadro's number on one side and half on the other? No, we can get some small fluctuations, but we never get these immense fluctuations where we see all the particles on one side and all the particles on the other. This number of equivalent microstates is a measure of the entropy. So this idea was formulated by Boltzmann who said the entropy was equivalent to some proportionality constant, this is the Boltzmann constant, times the natural log of the number of equivalent microstates, omega. So if we have more volume in a system, there's more ways to arrange our particles, that makes for more microstates and more entropy.
It's important to realize that these microstates are not just for arranging positions of molecules, but also how energy is distributed within the molecules and between the molecules. And so higher temperature will be more energy to distribute, more energy will be more microstates, more microstates will be more energy. Also, if we have more molecules in the system, more molecules means more microstates, more microstates means more entropy. And so all of these ideas play out that it is the number of equivalent microstates that we have, which is why some situations are higher in entropy. So let's look at a spontaneous change. Now let's imagine that we have our gas and it's confined to the left-hand side of our box because we put a wall there and so it can't go anywhere. And so this starts at a lower entropy configuration because there are fewer equivalent microstates for that situation. But if I remove the wall now, I know what's going to happen is the gas will spread out because it's just randomly moving around. How will it end up? Most likely it will end up spread out 50-50. And that's because in the 50-50 configuration, we have many equivalent microstates. So we go from a situation with few microstates, much lower entropy, to a situation with many, many microstates, much higher entropy. And this is the reason that we move from low entropy to high entropy. We're going from configurations which are less likely to occur to the configurations which are most likely to occur. So we will continue. We have to define the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that heat is a form of energy and the thermodynamic process are therefore subject to the principle of conservation of energy. This means that the heat energy cannot be created or destroyed the fundamental principles of the thermodynamics are expressed in four laws. Let us take a look at a video explaining the first law of the thermodynamics. Let's now explore the first law of thermodynamics. And before even talking about the first law of thermodynamics, some of you might be saying, well, what are thermodynamics? And you could tell from the, the roots of this word, you have thermo, related to thermal. It's dealing with temperature and the dynamics, the properties of temperature. How do they move? How does temperature behave? And that's pretty much what thermodynamics is. It's about, it's the study of heat and temperature and how it relates to energy and work and how different forms of energy can be transferred from one form to another. And that's actually at the heart of the first law of thermodynamics, which we touched on on the introduction to energy video. And the first law of thermodynamics tells us that energy, energy, this is an important one, I'm going to write it down, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Cannot be created, created or destroyed. Or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another. It can, it can only, only be converted, only be converted, I'm having trouble writing today, converted from one form, from one form to another. Or you could transfer it, but you're not going to, you're not going to create or destroy it. And the whole thing that I, the rest of this video, I just want to uh, really have you internalize that. And I want to look at a bunch of examples and think about, well, what is the energy that we're observing or that we're seeing in a system? And then thinking about where is that energy coming from? That to, to appreciate that it's not just coming out of nowhere and that it's not just disappearing. It's not getting destroyed either. And so let's start with this example of a light bulb. And I encourage you to pause this video, think about the forms of energy that we, we can see here, and then think about where is that energy coming from and where is it going? Well, the most for obvious form of energy that you see here, and this is the whole point of a light bulb, is you see the radiant energy. You see the, you see the electromagnetic waves, the light being emitted from it. And that light, so this is radiant energy, radiant energy, 
and that and that radiant energy that radiant energy is due to the heat in the filament right over here as the electrons go through it it generates heat so you have thermal energy so you have thermal energy as well thermal thermal energy but where does this radiant and thermal energy come from? It is, once again, the first law of thermodynamics that tells us it's not just being created out of thin air. It's, it's, it must be converted or being transferred from someplace. Well, I just gave you a hint. This thermal energy is due to the electrons moving through the filament. They're moving through the filament, which has some resistance, and that generates heat. So the electrons are moving through this. And as they move through that resistor, they generate heat. So you actually have the kinetic energy of the electrons. I'll just write Ke for short. Kinetic energy of the, electro, uh, of the actual electrons. Well, where is that kinetic energy coming from? Well, that's coming from the potential energy. You know, maybe this thing is plugged into, is plugged into a socket of some kind. So let me draw an electric socket right over here. And the electric socket, I'll draw... The electric socket, if this is the electric socket in your home, there is an electrostatic potential between the, these two terminals. And so when you make a connection, the electrons are able to, the electrons are able to move. And we will get into the details of AC and DC current in the future. But there's, a, there's an electrostatic potential from this point to this point, if we assume that's the direction that the electrons are going in. And so that, 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 it's that potential energy being converted to this kinetic energy of the electrons, which is really in the form of a current. And then that gets converted into thermal energy and radiant energy. Now what happens after, let's say, you unplug the light, the light goes dark? What happened to all of that energy? Is it still there? Well, yeah, that thermal energy is going to continue to dissipate through the system. And this right over here would be an open system. It's going to, uh, uh, the, the, the air inside the light bulb, you can't fully see the light bulb right here, but it looks something like this. That's going to heat up, but then it's going to heat up the glass surrounding the light bulb, and that's going to heat up the surrounding air. So the thermal energy is going to be transferred, and that radiant energy is going to move outward, and it could be used, it could be converted into other forms of energy, most likely thermal energy. It is also probably going to heat up other things. Well, what about a pool table? When I hit a, when I had a, if I hit a pool, uh, a billiard ball or a pool ball right over here, well, where is that energy going? Well, that some of that energy might be going to go hit the next ball, which might go to hit the next ball. But as we all know, if we've ever played, if we've ever played pool, at some point they're going to stop. So what happened to all of that energy? Well, while they were rolling, while they were rolling, there was some air resistance. There was some air resistance, so they're bumping against these air, the air molecules, and it's really friction due to air, and that energy is essentially going to be converted to heat. And one, one trend that you're going to see very frequently is as systems, as systems progress, a lot more of the energy tends to, tends to turn into heat rather than doing useful work. And so you're going to have, as the billiard balls move, there's the air. And so that's going to be, that, that's going to be converted. Some of that kinetic energy is going to be turned into heat energy. You're also going to have friction with the actual felt on the table. And that friction, you're going to have molecules rubbing up against each other. That's also going to be converted into heat. And so that, because that, that kinetic energy gets sapped off of it, uh, uh, gets keep, keeping sapped away from the friction, which is uh, essentially converting it, the kinetic energy to heat energy, eventually you won't have any more kinetic energy. Now what about this weightlifter here? He's using the chemical energy in, his, in the ATP in his muscles to that converts into a kinetic energy that moves his muscles, that moves this weight. But once he's in this position, what happened to all of that energy? Well, a lot of that energy is now being stored in potential. It's the potential energy. He's got this big weight He's got that big weight above his head, and if he were to let just let go, that thing would fall. I wouldn't recommend he do that, but that thing would fall quite fast. And so now it's all, or a lot of it, has been stored up in potential energy. But he would have also generated heat. His muscles would have generated heat. Even the act of moving it through the air is going to be some heat in the air, some friction with it. And so I want you to appreciate that this energy is not coming out of nowhere. It's, it, is, it is being converted from one form or another, or being transferred from one part of the system to another.
Now we can look at these examples over here. Same thing with a runner. What happens after you can, you can buy the fact that, okay, his chemical energy is allowing his muscles to move, and that's turning into his whole kinetic energy for his entire body. His body is moving, but at some point he stops. Where did all that, where did all that energy go? Well, some of it will be heat in his body that's being dissipated into the broader system, into the air. And also, when he was running, there would been there was this contact with the ground. That's going to make the molecules in the ground vibrate a little bit. Some of it will be transferred as sound, so the air particles moving through the air. And a lot of it will be heat. And we're going to see that over and over and over again. The diver up here. You have mostly potential energy. Then it converts to kinetic energy as he's, as he's get almost in the water. But what happens once he falls into the water? Well, then that energy is going to be transferred as you're going to have these waves of water move away. And it will also increase friction. So well, actually, you would have had friction as he fell down. So that would have generated some heat. And there would have been also some heat with the friction with the water. You normally don't think of friction with the water. But there is some friction with the actual water. And there's also your, these waves. You have higher kinetic energy of the actual water being transferred outward from where he actually dropped in. And I could keep going on and on. You have the potential, the chemical potential energy of the fuel here being trans. Be, you have combustion occurring. And then that gets converted into the thermal energy and the radiant energy of what we associate with fire. And that doesn't disappear. It just keeps the radiating outwards. The radiant energy just keeps radiating outward. Maybe it might heat up something. And the thermal energy will just keep radiating outward. And, and Or I should say, the thermal energy will just dissipate outward uh, and heat up the things around it. Same thing with our lightning example. You start with the electrostatic, you started with this electrostatic potential where the bottom of the clouds were more negative. And then the ground is positive as well. And at some point, that potential energy turns into kinetic energy as the electrons transfer through the air. And then that gets converted into, uh, or to a, to a good bit, it's going to be converted to heat and radiant energy. So uh, the whole point of this video is, well, no matter what example you look at, if you, look, if you think about it carefully enough, and I encourage you to do this in your everyday life, the energy isn't just coming out of, you know, magically appearing. It's, it's just being converted from one form to another. Let us take a look another video explaining the first law of thermodynamics. Professor Dave here. Let's discuss the first law of thermodynamics. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave explains. The first law of thermodynamics, popularly known as the law of energy conservation, when examined more rigorously, actually outlines the relationship between internal energy, work, and heat, which from now on will be represented by the letter Q. The law can be stated as an equation where delta U equals Q minus W. This means that the change in the internal energy of a system will be equal to the energy transferred to or from the system as heat, minus the energy transferred to or from the system as work, and all of these quantities will be measured in joules. Because of this law, we can outline a few different types of processes that can occur. If a process occurs where there is no change in volume for the system, that means that no pressure volume work can be done on or by the system, so work is zero. In such a case, delta U equals Q, and any change in internal energy must be the result of heat transfer in or out. This will be called an isovolumetric process, meaning no change in volume. An example would be a bomb calorimeter, where a combustion reaction produces a change in temperature, but the rigid walls result in no change in volume. If there is no change in the temperature of the system, there cannot have been any change in the internal energy of the system, since these two values are proportional. Delta U will be zero, which makes Q equal to W. This means that any heat transferred into the system is used by the system to do work rather than increasing the internal energy of a system. This is called an isothermal process, meaning no change in temperature. 
An ideal version of a car engine would be an example of this, as the pistons ought to convert all of the heat energy from the combustion reaction directly into expansion work that moves the car. If there is no heat transfer, Q will be zero, and delta U will equal negative W. This means that the internal energy of a system changes as a result of doing work on its surroundings or the surroundings doing work upon the system. Such a process will be called an adiabatic process, meaning no heat transfer. We can see this in certain processes in Earth's atmosphere as masses of air change position due to pressure differences. And if Q and W are both zero, meaning there is no heat transfer and no work done, there can be no change in internal energy, and this must be an isolated system. Hopefully these scenarios make some intuitive sense, because we will frequently use this equation to do calculations. We will also need to define the signs of these quantities in order to use this equation properly. So let's note that when heat is absorbed by the system, Q will be positive. If heat is lost by the system, Q will be negative. If work is done by the system, like an expanding gas, W will be positive. If work is done on the system by the surroundings, like gas compression, W will be negative. If there is no transfer of heat or no work done, these values can also equal zero, as we have previously discussed. When doing calculations, make sure that you use the correct signs for these values, or the math will be incorrect. For example, if 100 joules of compression work is done on a system, and as a result, the internal energy of the system increases by 74 joules, how much of the energy is transferred as heat and in which direction? Let's take our equation and rearrange to solve for Q, which will be delta U plus W. Then we can plug in positive 74 joules for delta U, since internal energy increases, and negative 100 joules for work, since work is being done on the system, and we should get negative 26 joules for heat. This means that as 100 joules of work is applied to the system, only 74 go towards increasing the internal energy of the system, while 26 joules are lost as heat dissipates out of the system. These kinds of calculations will happen a lot in thermodynamics, so let's check comprehension. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, Professor Dave Explain.